Good morning again, everyone. You're very well done. Big round of applause for Tom. <laughs> just, just letting us know he's back. Uh, welcome to everybody this morning uh, to Shiloh. Welcome to those watching in on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, we're going to finish this section, people will be shouting hallelujah, uh, on this church is at war, part one just so that you're aware. Right, we're only finishing part one. We've got to get rid of the demon possession bit. So if there's a lot of manifestations this morning, it's because we're trying to get over and done with. Maybe only one more, two more weeks on this side of it. And then we're going to be focusing on Jesus. Now don't be thinking, ah, oh, big sigh of relief. Isn't that wonderful? Because we're going to focus on not gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but Jesus who's taken no nonsense. Jesus who needs his people to know in these last days where we stand. Uh, and are we among those who on that day will stand and be told, depart from me, for I never knew you. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning that as we turn to your living and active word, that we can rely upon this truth. This is the truth that sets people free. This is the truth that's continually setting people free. And we thank you for it, Lord, and we want to walk in it. And we pray that your truth would triumph this morning in this place, that you would speak into each of our lives, speak into the lives of those that are watching in, Lord, on social media. We ask, Father, please, that you will be glorified. We know, Lord, that this is a difficult, difficult subject that we've been looking at, Lord, from January on this church is a war. But, Father, nonetheless, it needs to be discussed. Father, people contacting me during the week saying they've never heard this in their churches. Lord, help others to realize that the church is at war, particularly in these days, particularly as the day of the Lord draws near, uh, the warfare is going to intensify. And we need to be not, Lord God, just nice wee born-again Christians. We need to be soldiers of Christ, clothed in the armor of God, whose hands are trained for war, who can effectively use the weapons of warfare that you have given to us. So lead us by your spirit, please. In Jesus' name, amen. You're not going to hear probably some of you who are longer in the truth as Christians, you're not going to hear anything new and wonderful this morning. You might just see something from a different angle. Uh, but we're still looking at this subject, demon possession. And is it possible for Christian and non-Christian uh, or unbeliever? And, you know, it's not going to make a blind bit of difference. When you leave that place saying, I don't agree with them, that doesn't bother me. I'm only telling you what I'm sharing from God's word or what I have been see seeing in God's word really comes down to you having to search the scriptures to find out if these things be true or if Taddy Gordon's a heretic and you need to find another church to go to. Anyway, Western society and the church, I believe, have adopted what I'm calling a clinical reasoning mindset. Big flashy word. But a clinical reasoning mindset believes that if you buy into it, if you accept this clinical reasoning mindset, you will believe that the enemy is not at work in the church. You will find 101 other reasons rather than say this is the devil. You'll have this clinical reasoning trying to figure out everything else other than this is demonic. And I, I know I joked last week when I said how many of you over the past 20 years how many of you have gone to your GP with a particular ailment or problem and heard your GP say, well, now have you considered that this might be demonic? He would be struck off or she would be struck off if they said this. And this is what's called clinical reasoning. From our GPs through to psychiatrists and, 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 psych and psychologists and counsellors, right through schools, everywhere in society, they have this clinical reasoning mindset why therefore should we be surprised if it's also in the church and i believe that those who have bought into this believing that the enemy is is not at work he has made us or those who believe in this he has made us his winston wolf specialist cleaners remember pulp fiction and winston wolf comes to the door opens the door and it goes i'm winston wolf I'm a specialist cleaner. <laughs> and he could just clean up murder scenes as if they never happened. Well, the enemy has Winston Wolf cleaners. 
Only they clean up everything to do with the devil so that the devil doesn't exist. And I think that he has bought, he has got the church to buy into this lie and we, we actually clean up or sanitize his work making people believe that his evil unclean spirits and demons, that they don't exist, especially when it comes to mental illness or other disabilities. Clinical reasoning will look at circumstances or behaviours of individuals to try to understand what is happening or why people do the things that they do or, or why they are the way that they are. And they frequently, if not 99.9% .9 of the time, offer an ill-advised diagnosis. So take, for example, the daughter of Abraham that Jesus spoke about, the woman that was bound by a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. And it was Jesus that set her free. Well, modern day clinical reasoning would have offered this disabled woman only a clinical diagnosis. We would have said she's suffering from kyphosis and give her whatever medication she requires. But the outcome for that lady would have been that she was never loosed, that she would be never, she would never have been set free from the spirit of infirmity. But Jesus saw it for what it is. He saw it as a spirit of infirmity and he dealt with it accordingly. And today's modern society and the church, we embrace this clinical reasoning which too often rejects the idea of the demonic of the enemy taking advantage of people, controlling what they do, how they think, how they feel, how they act, spurning any notion of an evil, an evil spirit afflicting a person with illnesses or infirmities. And I wonder, you know, when you've been asked, or somebody has said to you, you know, I've really been suffering with a very bad pain in my back and my lower back and can't straighten up. I wonder how many of you have thought, I wonder could that be demonic? I'm not saying to you that you've got to diagnose everybody and think, see demons everywhere. But you shouldn't rule it out. It is an avenue that you need to investigate prayerfully before the Lord. Christian, we need to waken up to the warfare and to the fact that the enemy may have duped us. He may have duped us about how he actually operates, particularly when it comes to demonic possession. Do we have a wrong view of demonic possession? Well, in UK law, there's a legal expression which says, possession is nine-tenths of the law, meaning ownership is easier to maintain if a person has possession of something and it's difficult to enforce if a person does not. So hear this this morning. It's the UK law. And it says this. Possession is. Now, and it's not talking about demonic possession at this point. But you'll get the point. Possession is nine tenths of the law. Meaning ownership is easier to maintain. If a person has possession of something. And difficult to enforce. If a person does not. Turn please to John chapter 2. I'm going to read two very similar passages this morning. But I just want to make a point. John chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 13 and it says this now the Passover, Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business now it doesn't sound like anything weird or wonderful going on here but there's a man that comes to this church who left the church very, very recently because he said it was turning into a market where they were selling stuff on the Sunday morning. Hear this again. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. That merchandise. Listen to what Jesus is saying. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Turn then please to, um, the next one is in Mark's Gospel. And we're reading Mark's Gospel 
from chapter 11, chapter 11 we're reading through 15 through to 18. Now it's a similar event here but again listen to what Jesus is saying or what they're telling us. These are different people giving us an account of what took place in the temple. So from verse 15 of Mark 11. So they came to Jerusalem as Jesus and his disciples. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Listen, when I tell you, if you have got this nonsense in your head about gentle Jesus making mild, that he's some sort of snowflake woke saviour. He drove these people out. He made it with force. He drove them out of the temple. He, in one occasion, he had a whip whipping them. He tumbled over the tables and the money was going everywhere. He drove them out and said, get out! Get out of here! He was angry with them at what they were doing. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Verse 17. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written... My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Listen to what Jesus is saying. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the priests heard it and sought how they might destroy Jesus. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When you read in the Old Testament, for example, um, in Ezekiel chapter 8, and I would encourage people to go and read today, Ezekiel chapter 8 through you know, chapter 10, just to give you a, a, a snippet of what happens here. But in, in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapter 8, the Holy Spirit uh, takes the prophet Ezekiel in a vision to the temple of the Lord to show him the idolatry of Israel. Now listen please this morning. The Holy Spirit takes the prophet Ezekiel, the man anointed by God, in whom we saw in chapter 2 and chapter 3 that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, wipes out the nonsense that no, no believers in the Old Testament were filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. You see it in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Here he is in chapter 8 being taken by the Spirit of God into the temple to, to, to be shown the idolatry of Israel. Now remember this. All idolatry in whatever form. All idolatry is demon worship. Whether you like that or not, whether you believe it or not, this is what the Bible teaches. All idolatry is demon worship. And at the door of the north gate to the inner court of the temple, Ezekiel is shown an image, an idol which is called the idol which provokes to jealousy. Now I'm reading into that, that this idol has been placed there by some Jews and it has provoked God to jealousy because he will not share his glory with another. He's then, Ezekiel is then shown a room and it's a secret room when you read the chapter yourself you'll see it is a secret room and in the secret room we're told there's every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts and the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. Do you hear this? Idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And next the Spirit of God leads him to where he sees women in the temple and they are weeping, they are crying for Tammuz. That is a, a false god, that is a fertility god that they are crying to. And finally he has shown 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they were worshipping the sun toward the east. This is happening in the temple. The idolatry would lead to the glory of God leaving the temple. So when you read in Ezekiel chapter 10, you will see stage by stage how the, the, the Lord just removed his presence from the temple. And so this idolatry would lead to the glory of God leaving the temple and eventually to the temple's destruction. This demon worship, because all forms of idolatry are demon worship. This demon worship 
occurred in various places within the temple of God. Now I know that the presence of God was in the Holy of Holies. And I know that there's very little likelihood that there was any demon worship in the Holy of Holies. Because only the, the high priest could go in once a year on the Day of Atonement. Anybody else was likely to be struck down dead. But this was happening in different parts of the temple. Well, Some scholars believe that there were two incidents when Jesus drove out the money changers or the merchants out of the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm not so sure if there is two incidents or if it's just um, different uh, witness accounts of what took place. Jewish people, you've got to remember, <clears throat> Jewish people travelled from various nations to Jerusalem for the great feasts they were called there. It was the law of God that they had to come up at least three times a year to these great feasts uh, to worship the Lord. And obviously, if they came from Northern Ireland, we're just using that as a joke, you know, they would take British sterling to Israel and they would ask for it to be changed into the currency of the temple or the temple shekel. And the money changers that were there in the temple, they ripped people off. Now, I have to say, when I went to Israel, and I, I was out a couple of times, I loved finding the money changers in the streets on Israel because they give you a far better deal than the actual banks. And in the banks and everybody warned you, don't go to these people, they're ripped off artists and all, and you're not sure what you're going to get. I always found that I got more shekels from a pound than what the bank gave me, and these boys didn't charge you. But in this case, in the days of Jesus, the money changers exploited these opportunities, and they were charging the people extortionate fees while others were in the temple, they were selling animals and all types of wares to the would-be worshippers who had come from all over the nations to worship the Lord. And in Jesus' day, the temple had become more of a marketplace where it seems the love of money competed with love for God. These people were in there grabbing every opportunity to squeeze every last penny that they could out of these travellers who were coming to worship the Lord. And so there was this uh, competitiveness, love of money against a love for God. Let me say it again. Anything in a person's life that takes the place of God, including love of money, is idolatry. At its very root, it is demon worship. Now hear that. That is a word to the Christian. If there is something in your life, Christian, that is taking the place of God, if God is not first in your life, whatever is taking his place is idolatry. And that idolatry at its root is demon worship. Now let me speak to the unbeliever. If you are not a believer, if you are not a Christian this morning, then you cannot truly worship God in spirit and in truth because you haven't been born again. And therefore, whatever in your life as an unbeliever is taking the rightful place of God, whatever that might be, you are committing idolatry. You are demon worshipping at its roots. In Ezekiel 8, and in our passages in John and Mark, some idolatry was hidden. Hear that, Christian? That he was told to dig through a hole in the wall. Read it for yourself in Ezekiel 8. Dig through a hole in the wall where he found a door. And when he opened the door he went in. And all around the walls were all of these abominable things. All of these idols that the people of Israel were worshipping. It was hidden. Not everybody knew where it was. Some is hidden. While some is in plain sight in the temple of God. Or as Jesus called it, in my father's house. This was happening, as Jesus said, in my father's house. Now I believe, and you don't have to agree with me, but I believe that these illustrate why many Christians have a wrong view of demonic possession. Let me be clear, demonic possession doesn't necessarily mean complete loss of control or of identity or of ownership. It doesn't mean that. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. Ownership is easier to maintain if a person has possession of something and difficult to enforce if a person does not. And so at the dedication of the temple... God told King Solomon these words. This will make sense in a moment. 
At the dedication of the temple, God told King Solomon these words. Now I have chosen and sanctified this house. This is the temple where there was the secret room of all the idols of Israel. This is the temple where the women of Israel were praying to Tammuz. This is the temple where there was the idol that provoked to jealousy. This is the temple that the Jewish men inside had turned their backs to it and were worshipping the sun. This is what God says. Now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. God is clearly claiming ownership of the temple. Do you hear that? He is saying it's mine. He is claiming ownership of this temple, which by the way, he designed and he had Solomon build. You remember David wanted to build the temple and God said, no, you can't build it because there's blood on your hands and it was good that it was in your heart to want to do it, but your son is going to build it. But God had already given the design, so God had designed it and appointed Solomon to build it, but it was always God's temple. He was claiming ownership. Possession and ownership of the temple belonged to God. And Jesus confirmed this by calling it in my father's house. So now we know who owned the temple. However, although the temple belonged to God, demons were there. Hear that this morning. Although the temple belonged to God, demons were there. And they had seduced people away from worshipping the Lord to idolatry, to demonic worship. And it was happening in the temple. Let me tell you something today. You think, "Ah, Tally, that's years ago. No, it's not. It's now. It's happening now. Today, and I will explain how. Some of you have heard me speak of the Old Testament types and shadows which point to greater things to come. So for example, if you go into the Old Testament and you read about the Old Testament high priest, well he was a shadow, he was a a type, he was a forerunner of Jesus, the great high priest who was to come. Or if you look at the Old Testament and you see all the sacrifices of the lambs and all of these different things, sacrifices for sin, well, they were shadows and types. They pointed to a greater sacrifice that was to come. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who would sacrifice himself for the sins of the world. Well, so too I believe that the Old Testament temple is a shadow. It is a type of something greater. There are those who believe the something greater is the church. Okay? There are those who believe that all of the Old Testament stuff to do with the temple was a shadow and a type that was pointing to something greater to come. And they believe that it is the church. In fact, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, he says, For we, talking to the believers, talking to born-again Christians, For we are the temple of the living God. Or as the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, you also, speaking to Christians, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. You are being built into a temple for God. Now, whatever is your view on the church as the new new temple or not, perhaps it still speaks of something greater still to come. But we know this for a fact. Paul speaking to born again Christians says these words. Do you not know that your body is speaking to born again Christians? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? This is what he's saying to you. If you're a born again Christian this morning, he is saying you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You are not your own. And just like the Old Testament temple, which belonged to God, who claimed ownership of it, so too the born again Christian belongs to God. There is no doubt about that. 
that is recorded for all of eternity, the born-again Christian belongs to God. We are not our own. We belong to another. And the word that Paul uses here is a real intimate word between a man and his wife in marriage. We belong to another. We are intimately connected with the Lord. And that connection cannot be broken. However, having said that, I believe that the enemy, and I want you to hear me this morning, don't necessarily have to agree, but think about what I'm telling you. I believe the enemy can still seek to take possession of areas of our lives, our temples, just like he did in the temple in Ezekiel's day, in the days of Jesus, to seduce us away from God and get us to yield areas of our lives to him. Remember, demonic possession doesn't necessarily mean complete loss of control, loss of identity, or a claim to ownership. Satan can't claim us as his. We belong to the Lord. We have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But he is a liar, he is a thief, and he will come with his deceitful and deceptive ways to gain ground in our lives, and he will possess areas of our lives. If the enemy gets that foothold, he will seek to create obsessions. He will move it further if he can to oppression. And if further, he will take possession of areas of your life. And I believe that the only way that a person, when it gets to that point where he is taking possession of areas of your life, I believe the only way... The only way that a person can be set free is by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ where the demon is commanded to leave and they are loosed like the woman in the, in the synagogue who was loosed from her infirmity. I'm driving this home again for a reason. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. Ownership is easier to maintain if a person has possession of something and is very difficult to enforce if a person does not. Let me say it again, Christian. You belong to the Lord. He has possession of you. He has that and he will maintain that possession. The enemy will never be able to steal you away from the Lord. You see, this is why Jesus could drive the money changers out of the temple because possession is nine-tenths of the law. Ownership is easier to maintain if a person has possession of something and difficult to enforce if a person does not. Those money changers could have said, who did that man think he is? Give him a kick and throw him out. But they didn't. Why? Because Jesus could drive the money changers and the other merchants out of the temple because the father, his father, had ownership of it they had no right to be there so christian again we belong to the lord we are his treasured possession we are his peculiar his special people we are not our own we have been bought we have been redeemed with the precious blood of jesus we are the temple of the lord he claims ownership of us. He will never, not even for a moment, let that ownership be taken away. There is no question of ownership. We cannot lose our identity other than believing the lies of the enemy, thinking that we have lost our identity in Christ. We will always belong to the Lord. But I believe through the deceitfulness of the enemy, we can permit ourselves to surrender areas of our lives to the control, not ownership, of the enemy by yielding to his seducing ways. There are demons in the temple. So take, for example, a broader view of the temple. Take for a view, uh, take for a view a broader, take, for example, a broader view of the church across the UK. There are demons in the temple. There are demons in the pulpits. There are cassock wearing possessed men and women trying to present what they say is a truth, which is utter lies. 
There is a bringing together of multi-faith congregations who are buying into demonic lies. There is this push for the church to embrace Islam. And we see it with the Roman Catholic Church wanting to make friends with Islam. We cannot make friends with false gods. There is one God and one God only. And we worship him. The demons are in the temple. They are everywhere. And we are being forced by government and by others to embrace them and to worship them. And some of it today, believe me, some of it is so well hidden that you don't even know what's going on. We need to waken up to what is happening in our nation. We need to waken up to what is happening in the church. We need to waken up, Christian, to the warfare. This in my eyes is demonic possession. When the enemy can come in through deceitful ways and seducing us away from the Lord to take possession of areas of our lives when we give ground to the enemy. But let me drive this home again. No matter how much ground we give him. No matter if we turn out to be like the Gadarene demoniac with 2,000 demons in us. We will still always belong to the Lord. Because we have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he will never ever forsake us. He will never leave us. And whatever things may be permitted to come into our lives through sin that we're messing about with. Through things that are going on all around us. God will not forsake us. We have a responsibility to guard against the enemy's attacks. Look, I respect 100%. I respect that there are people who do not believe a born-again Christian can be demon-possessed. I respect that, but I'm only simply asking, could their view or their idea of demon possession be wrong? Because the devil's a liar, a deceiver, and he can change how we think. Or maybe it's me. Maybe I've got it wrong. Well, I would say to you, search the scriptures and see for yourself. Let me say something. Just because the Holy Spirit dwells within us does not mean that we cannot yield areas of our lives to the enemy. Do you hear that? Just because we have the Spirit of God living in us, just because we are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption, just because he abides in us and we abide in him, does not mean that we cannot yield areas of our lives to the devil. And it doesn't always mean if we yield areas to the, li- to the devil that he's going to possess us. But you leave yourself wide open for that. So Christian... This morning you might hold a different view to me and that's fine. But I hope we agree on this. That this church is at war. And we need to know our enemy. We need to know how he operates. And in the name of Jesus Christ we need to resist him. That he might flee from us. And thanks be to Jesus who gives us the victory. But let me ask you Christian. Not asking about your own personal walk. That's between you and God. You can ask him this afternoon yourself. But let me ask you, do you think there's demons in the temple? When you look at the church collective as a body, when you see the state that the church is in, when you see the woke snowflake Christian ministers getting up into the pulpits with their moralistic stories and their absolute rubbish that they're rhyming off, And they're pontificating about the need to to love one another and embrace all of these false religions. And and we've got to accept Islam and, and Hinduism and all of these things. Do you seriously believe that there's no demons in the temple? I watched the news this morning. Don't know if anybody else saw it. Six o'clock this morning. There was a woman on talking about a person. I don't want to go into too much, but... There's a woman on talking about desperately, desperately wanting a member of their family healed from cancer. And I felt for them, and I felt for the person, you know, that has the cancer. And they were doing amazing stuff, this person that was 
with a cancer. They weren't letting it, you know, dictate to them. They were getting on with their life and doing wonderful things. But nonetheless, they're going to die according to the news broadcast. I don't, I don't know if anybody else saw it. And one thing I picked up straight away was here it was a person desperate for some help for their daughter. And sitting behind her on the shelf, it's almost like as if it was sitting on her shoulder, it was a statue of a Hindu god. And I thought, and you want help? You've got idols in your house. Remember God said to Ezekiel when the men came, the people of Israel came to Ezekiel to say, is there a word from the Lord for us? And God says, I would not have these people inquire of me. They've got idols in their hearts. I'm not prepared to tell them anything other than the judgment that I'm going to bring against them. Let me ask you, Christian, have you got idols in your heart? It may not be a physical idol in your house, but trust me, I have been in Christians' houses and they've got them, they've even got them in their gardens, Buddhas and, and everything else. I've seen them with their, their, their crystals and their dream catchers and, and all that cack all around their house. And then they're saying, I'm worshipping the Lord. Be careful what you're doing. The enemy is a deceiver. And he will get you first and foremost to compromise your faith. And when you begin to compromise your faith, what you will find is suddenly you'll think, well, maybe we should be a wee bit more tolerant toward these other people of different religions. Listen, I'm telling you, we, we have to love them. We don't have to embrace their false religions under any circumstances. So again, I want to ask you this morning, Christian, is there demons in the temple? That's between you and God. You can say, but I don't believe in that. I don't, I don't care what you believe. I'm asking you to go before God and ask God, is there demons in the temple? Maybe there's someone here this morning and you're not yet a born again Christian. Well, let me just say this again, this point. Possession is nine tenths of the law. Ownership is easier to maintain if a person has possession of something and difficult to enforce if a person does not. If you're not a born again Christian at this present time outside of Christ, not being a born again Christian, then you are in a sense in the possession of the enemy. And in that sense, he has a legal hold on you because of your sin. But the Bible says, if, if you humbly come to the Lord, if you confess your sin, agree with God that you are a sinner, if you repent, if you're prepared to put away all of your idols and put away sin from your lives and trust in Jesus, then you too can be set free. My word to you this morning is simple. Don't let the enemy possess you. Surrender your life to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, again, I know that this is a really difficult subject and there are those, Lord, with greater minds than mine who think different to me with, regarding, uh, with regard to demon possession. But I can only tell what I see. And Lord, we see in the temple that there was demons. And the people were worshipping demons. Even in secret rooms, Lord, they were bound down to idols. And we need to waken up to the reality that the church is at war. And these idols are trying to infiltrate every single church. They're trying to infiltrate our lives. Anything, Lord, in our lives that takes your place, your rightful place, is an idol and it needs to be ripped out, it needs to be torn down, it needs to be broken so that your lordship and your reign, Lord, extends to every area of our lives completely. <laughs> Lord, help us, please, to walk closely with you. Help us, please, to go before you even this afternoon and say, Lord, are there any idols in this temple? If so, remove them, please, in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I ask for anyone here or watching in who's not yet a Christian, that you would help them to see that in that sense, Lord, they are in the possession of the evil one. Even though, Lord God, you've paid the price for their sin through Jesus. Even though, Lord God, they can be set free through Jesus. They, Lord God, in that sense, are in the possession of the evil one who wants to drag them, Lord, into an eternity without Christ. 
pray today that people would wise up and waken up to what is going on around them and that they would humbly come to you O God confessing their sin repenting and putting their trust in Jesus Christ your son